Motorcycle history is riddled with as many flops as there are big ones, but we reckon there are many that would find favor if they were revived. Hello, and welcome to another video, as you have guessed today's topic, but before going further please subscribe my channel and don't forget to like videos, let's get on with the video. The XR1200 in 2008 was the result with tuned 1200 Sportster V-Twin power, decent handling, and great looks. And yet, it bombed, particularly in the US. An updated XR1200 are followed in 2010 with improved multi-adjustable suspension which did little better and the whole project was canned in 2012. Which is a shame as it wasn't a bad bike, just not, at 90 brake horsepower, quite powerful enough, being too heavy to impress against European rivals and not backed enough by Harley USA to succeed stateside. Today, however, with HD USA fully into modern global bikes, as proven by the Pan Am and Livewire, plenty of experience to draw on and a new 120 brake horsepower, liquid-cooled Sportster S to base it on, a retro Roadster XR1250 could be fabulous. 9. Husqvarna Nuda 900 Few modern bike brand stories are as checkered as that of historic Swedish off-road specialist Husqvarna. Bought by Kajiva in 1987 with production moving to Varese in Italy, it was then sold to BMW in 2007 who, after various difficulties, including falling foul of Italian trade unions, disposed of it to KTM in 2013. Which was a shame as the latest bikes today are little more than restyled Dukes while under BMW ownership it's new to 900, although a sales flop was sensational. Essentially a forerunner of today's F900R, but better equipped and better looking, the Nuda 900 was based on the F800 but enlarged, tuned to 105 brake horsepower and fitted with Brembo's and more. In short, pretty much exactly what the KTM 790 Duke was nearly a decade later. Dial and a bit of Steve McQueen styling, then Husky had been experimenting with that, too, with its Moab concept bike and today it'd have both the KTM 890 and BMW F900 are beat. Easily. 8. MV Augusta Brutale 920 How many times have Italian Exotica specialists MV Augusta almost got it right? How many chances do they need? Well, for our money, it got closest of all with the ultra-short-lived Brutale 920 of 2011 to 2012. Developed during Harley-Davidson's brief tenure, the 920 was intended as the entry-level brood ale with a more basic spec, which probably put people off, cause if you're going to buy an MV you probably want to buy the maddest, most extreme version available. Wrong. The 920 was brilliant, it's refined, smooth yet grunty 130 brake horsepower was more than enough for a road roadster, its handling and ride was far, far better than most MVs, too, it looked great and it was affordable. With the 920, by comparison the 910, 989 and 990 were all too extreme and expensive, MV Augusta should have hit the mass market big time if marketed and distributed right. Except it didn't because Harley got cold feet, offloaded it back to the Castiglione's for a euro and they went back to their bad old ways of producing extreme exotica nobody actually wanted to buy. 7. Buell 1125CR Ah uh, yes, Buell, Eric's bold but bonkers pipe dream which, some good ideas accepted, never quite worked out what it wanted to be, especially when Harley-Davidson took over and wedged in its Sportster V-Twin engines. Except, it very nearly struck gold at least on. Buell's last gasp, Rotax-powered, 146 brake horsepower 1125 or Sportster was a really quite good, if odd looking, road Sportster that never got a chance because Buell rushed the press launch with flawed bikes. By the time its fueling was sorted, its sister super naked, the 1125CR was available and, ridiculous low handlebars aside, was even better, its performance being more competitive, its style more distinctive. 
sadly, that bike never really got a chance either, was sold uncomfortably through Harley dealers, never caught on in the US, and the whole Buell operation was shut down after the CR had barely been around two years. Today it'd stand a far better chance, which is handy because Buell has just risen from the grave for a third time. 6. Moto Morini 1200 Grand Paso one of the most unsung of the revived historic Italian brands finding its way again in the early 00s, Moto Morini was also actually one of the best and its final bike, sort of, was also among the most underrated. Moto Morini was revived in 1999 before launching its first all-new bike, the 1187 cubic centimeters V-Twin Corsaro in 2005. It was a more than decent bike, too, with 140 brake horsepower fiery BHP and good handling. On the downside, it was let down with initially iffy fueling, corporate underfunding and a lack of publicity and sales infrastructure. Better bikes followed, the Retro Scrambler, the high-spec Corsaro Veloce in 2006, and, latterly, in 2008 the Grand Paso Adventure Sport. Sadly, however, around the same time financial problems sent the whole concern into meltdown from which it has struggled since. Which is again a shame as the detuned, fine handling, styling and fun Grand Paso was largely ahead of its time, Triumph Tiger 1050 Sport and BMW S1000 XR anyone, and deserved better. Even today its performance, versatility, style and fun would stack up well. 5. Yamaha MT-01 One of the boldest and most beautifully crafted bikes of the early noughties was also one of the most misunderstood and, well, unsuccessful. The big, brash MT-01, Yamaha's first Masters of Torque machine, was initially a show-slash-concept bike which Yamaha bravely put into production in 2005, although we're still not entirely sure why. And what a bike! At its heart was a monster, low revving, 1,700 cubic centimeters, pushrod V-twin put into an exquisite, but big, roadster chassis complete with multi-adjustable suspension, radial brakes and the best of everything. Even its dash was jewel-like. The experience, meanwhile, was like nothing else, a cacophony of rumbling grunt, an almost regal ride, a thunderous soundtrack and a sense of occasion like nothing else. Sadly, cynics also described it as underwhelming slow, overbearingly heavy, and eye-wateringly expensive, so no one bought one. The Philistines Today, in this retro-driven world it might do better, although it'd never have got through Euro 5. 4. Honda CB1000 Oh, get over yourselves already. It's funny to think that the late 1990s Japanese obsession with big four-cylinder retros likes the XJR1200 and CB1300, plus the later GSX1400 and ZRX11 and 1200, were all beaten to the punch by one of the biggest and best of all, the 1992 CB1000 Big One. And in light of how feeble and largely dismal Honda's current offerings on the class are, i.e. the CB1100 and CB1000 are, Big H could do worse than revive it today. At the time, the big one, a ham, flopped because it was expensive and arguably before its time. But it was also fabulously put together, HRC were involved, if memory serves, gloriously grunty and smooth thanks to its detuned CBR1000F liquid cooled for, surprisingly fine handling and, with proportions seemingly 10% larger than anything else, had a road presence like nothing else. Churn it out today with a more reasonable ticket price, assuming, as with most others, it could be made to get through Euro 5, and Honda would have the biggest and best Retro 4 of all. 3. Moto Guzzi V11 Another one with more than a hint of irony. Guzzi's modern V-twin Retro Roadster, the V7, is the Italian Mark's best-selling bike but has only now got the 850 cubic centimeters performance it should have had from the outset and remains slightly dinky and novice-orientated. Oh, for a slightly more substantial, credible V9 or V11 even. Hang on, Guzzi did one, years ago, but back then was again years before its time, sadly hamstrung by Guzzi's off-field woes and would today, 
surely, have a much better chance of success. The original V11 was launched under Aprilia ownership in 2001, was great looking, decent performing, with 91 brake horsepower, and spawned a whole series of variants in different specs and styles. In truth, by then it was already too late, Aprilia was hemorrhaging cash and despite improved build quality and sometimes mouth-watering spec, the V11 was before the retro boom and never going to get the recognition and success it deserved. Wind on 20 years, though, and a new V11 to the same style and spec would be stupendous, wouldn't it? 2. KTM RC8 KTM's long-awaited superbike version of its big V-twin was plagued by delays, finally launched in 2008 and was such a failure it was deleted by 2010. The RC8 suffered from a comically bad timing having been built with the intention to compete in the World SBK Championship, however, a shift in regulations while it was being completed meant it would have never been competitive, thus nixing its reason d'etri. Nevertheless, for a first effort at a sports bike, the RC8, though a bit of a handful, was a pretty solid, albeit underpowered first effort and has since won a cultish following since. Time has moved on though and KTM, now winning races in MotoGP, has the architecture of the 1290 Super Ducar, which has had enduring cries of an RC revival ever since. If it uses the chassis know-how from both KTM's other smaller RCs and its MotoGP experience, equip it with the latest electronics and style it like Brad Binder and Miguel Oliveira's factory machine and you'd have a surefire winner, wouldn't you? 1. Ducati Sport Classic Probably no surprise as the Sport Classic has regularly been touted as a bike before its time. But when you also add that to the current paucity of Ducati's retro roadster lineup, when surely it should be right up there with Triumph, the argument for bringing back the Sport Classics gets stronger still. No wonder they're so in demand used. The Sport Classics were first launched in 2005 initially with the Fared Paul Smart Limited Edition, but also the unfared, more affordable Sport 1000. Both being 992 cubic centimeters, air-cooled V-twins with bags of style, handling, and a decent 92 brake horsepower. The twin-seat GT arrived a year later. With hindsight, all were brilliant. Trouble was, they didn't sell. The Sport was solo only and uncomfortable, the smart expensive, the more practical GT less of a looker and, besides, retro bikes had yet to catch on. Ducati meddled with the recipes over the next few years, finally coming up with versions that were stylish, practical, and affordable all at the same time, but by then, 2010, it was too late and Ducati pulled the plug. All, however, were also classier, better looking, better performing, better built and more cohesively thought out than any scrambler. Shame, 